Hello everyone and welcome to chapter four, the nervous system basics and the central nervous system. Surprise, it's not just the endocrine system that uses chemicals. The nervous system also uses neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that cross a synapse. The synapse, of course, is the gap between a neuron and another neuron, muscle cell or gland. Now, <clears throat> before we dive into the central nervous system, I want to talk about the overview in general of the nervous system. And by now, most of you should have already done the first day's attendance video. And I have seen a lot of responses that you were surprised by how much was involved with the nervous system. There is so much going on with the nervous system, we are actually going to cover it for two weeks. This week will be a general overview and the central nervous system, and next week will be the peripheral nervous system. So what are the nervous system functions? Well, there are three main ones. The first one is sensing. It's going to be collecting data from the environment, both the external environment around us and the internal environment inside of us. It's going to be interpreting, which is processing data and formulating a response to the things that it senses. And then acting, it's telling the body to perform the response from what it interpreted, from what it had initially sensed. Now, <clears throat> the nervous system divisions are the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The central nervous system is composed of the brain, spinal cord, and their coverings. And the peripheral nervous system is made up of the cranial nerves, the spinal nerves, and the ganglia, which are bundles of nerves. The peripheral nervous system, often just titled PNS, also has two main subdivisions. These are the somatic and visceral parts of the body that it innervates. Now, the somatic subdivision monitors and controls the bones muscles, soft tissues, and the skin. The word somatic is actually derived from Greek, meaning of the body. The other subdivision is called the autonomic subdivision. It is the visceral or autonomic subdivision is associated with internal glands, organs, blood vessels, and mucous membranes. The word viscera is from Latin, meaning internal organ. Autonomic is from Greek, meaning independence. When you combine the meanings, you get independence of internal organs. Now, very often people call this involuntary, and although it operates without conscious control, you're not using your mind to say, hey, I want to move my organ, I want to start digestion, it's actually regulated by parts of the brain. Now, the autonomic nervous system is divided even further into three separate systems. It's the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric aspects of the ANS. The sympathetic ANS activates arousal responses and expends body resources in response to emergencies, excitement, or exercise. This is where we often hear the flight, fight, or fear system. But any highly emotional state, even of joy, excitement, elation, is also sympathetic in nature. Now, the parasympathetic ANS reverses the response of the sympathetic ANS by returning the body to a non-alarm state and restoring body resources. The parasympathetic ANS is considered the rest and digest system. So sympathetic, you get scared, you get excited. Parasympathetic, you calm back down. The enteric nervous system, the ENS, is the third part of the ANS. Enteric means pertaining to the intestines. The ENS has an extensive two-way connections with the central nervous system. It works with the central nervous system to control the digestive system and all of the body's physiological demands. 
One nerve that you're going to hear a lot about the more that you delve into information about massaging calming the nervous system will be the vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve that comes directly from the brain. And it supplies most of the abdominal viscera among other structures and organs. And it plays a huge role in the enteric nervous system functions. So what is the nervous system structure actually made of? So the basic structure is the neuron or the nerve cell. The nervous system is composed of more than 100 billion with a B nerve cells. The nerve cell is an impulse transmitting fiber connecting the central nervous system with all parts of the body through the peripheral nervous system. And there are three types of these neurons. There's the afferent or sensory neurons, which carry impulses to the central nervous system. There are connecting or associative neurons known as interneurons, which transmit nerve impulses between neurons, and efferent or motor neurons, which transmit impulses away from the central nervous system to muscles, organs, and glands. So motor neurons come away from the central nervous system, sensory neurons go to the central nervous system, and connecting or associative, you know, we're associates, we're connected to each other. They transmit nerve impulses between neurons. Now, in this lecture, I'm not going to delve too deeply into the neuroglia or the dendrites, all of that. We have fantastic videos that explain it far better than I do um, that I really want you guys to focus on, which brings me to another point. Please, no matter what you accomplish for the day, try to at least do the attendance questions by the due date every single day because I usually will include information for you. There's just so much going on in these chapters that I want to make sure that we cover it in the best way as possible. And I try to make it in interesting, digestible pieces for you. And these attendance videos, I think, do a pretty good job of doing that. Now, one thing I absolutely do want to mention as we go throughout this chapter is nerve repair or regeneration. Now, not the actual function of it, but just some anecdotal stuff. I've been told once that it takes 22 to 25 years for a nerve to regenerate itself. And I have a massage client who was hit by a car and severed multiple nerves in his shoulder, upper trapezius, and in his back 23 and a half years ago. Those nerves are finally starting to reconnect quite painfully. There are random motor movements. There are random sensory things that he feels like burning, itching, tingling, sporadic numbness switches out with uh, various sensations of things touching his skin, oversensitivity to clothing, and his back is actually starting to get a significant portion of the feeling back that it has not had for over 20 years. So that's pretty cool to actually see it in action in that time frame, 22 to 25 years later, as these nerves are starting to regenerate. Now, if a neuron cell body is fully damaged, the neuron dies. But if the damage occurs only to the axon of a neuron, and the rest of it is not destroyed, the nerve can actually repair itself. It just takes a long time. It's not like blood cells that replace themselves every 120 days because the body is making more. As you probably learned in today's attendance video, the neurons you have are the neurons you have. Another thing I'd like to cover here pertaining to massage and the nervous system is you know, after transmitting an impulse, a neuron cannot immediately fire again. It needs time for the sodium and potassium to return to the original location and repolarize the membrane. And this time is called the refractory period. The refractory period is a brief period after inhibition when the neuron recovers. The absolute refractory period is the time during which a neuron will not respond to any stimuli. 
This is followed by the relative refractory period when the neuron will respond only to something really strong. All right, so there needs to be a certain threshold. A neuron calls it a threshold stimulus. It's the minimum level of a stimulus needed to trigger the opening of the first sodium channel when we excite a nerve. Now, after we have entered into this refractory period, now we're in the relative refractory period, this threshold stimulus actually becomes higher. Now, why does this matter to you? Well, therapeutic massage methods like muscle energy techniques and my favorite, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, use the refractory period to their advantage. Muscles often resist lengthening by initiating a protective spasm. So someone's coming in with chronic calf pain, their calf muscle does not want to lengthen and you are trying to stretch that muscle. You're doing some compression. It resists it by trying to spasm and tighten up. If the muscle is first contracted and then lengthened, it's less likely to spasm during the refractory period and the muscle can be restored more easily to a more normal resting length. Because these refractory periods are short, Gentle applications of lengthening procedures must be used, all right? We're not going to punch someone in the calf. Methods that generate any sort of strong stimuli, especially pain, must be avoided. If a stimulus that is too strong is introduced instead of inhibiting, the muscle will generate nerve impulses and contract, thus resisting any sort of lengthening or stretching method, methods. Now, this is a little bit different from trigger point therapy. When we are doing proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, we are concentrating on gentle full stretching, which is different than dealing with dermatomes and myotomes, which we talk about in another chapter with trigger point therapy, which can very often lead to pain because we are working on the muscles that are dealing with referred pain areas. Now, just a brief side note on the parts of a synapse. All right, so remember that nerves transmit both electrical and chemical signals, all right? electrical and neurotransmitters, the chemicals, right? And a synapse is the space or junction between two neurons or a neuron and an effector organ. An effector organ produces an effect in response to nerve stimulation, right? So in a synapse, the chemicals called neurotransmitters transfer a nerve impulse across the gap to the next cell. The neuron that is in front of the gap, in front of the synapse, is called the presynaptic neuron because it's before the synapse, pre. The neuron or effector organ receiving the signal is postsynaptic or after the synapse. And the actual space in the synapse is called the synaptic cleft. Your book has a pretty good illustration of it on page 118. Um, I have an image for you here as well. I just want you to realize um, <clears throat> that there is a gap between them that constantly has to be jumped, this synaptic cleft. Nothing is actually touching. Everything needs a small jump to go across. And in all of these synaptic clefts, you will see vesicles, these small sacs, and then receptors on the postsynaptic either organ or neuron where they actually receive the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are absolutely awesome. We do cover it a little bit more extensively this week and next week in class. So far, only 50 or so neurotransmitters have been identified, although we suspect that there are dozens more. When they're released into the bloodstream, we call many of these neurotransmitters hormones, and that's when we begin to confuse them with the endocrine system. Um, but neurotransmitters have basically three chemical categories, 
amino acids, amines, and peptides. And we'll go into that in depth later, but just remember that the nervous system deals not only with electrical energy, but also with chemicals. I'm sure by now you've heard the term homeostasis many, many times, especially after taking MT-105. Now, neurotransmitters have neuromodulators, and they balance each other like a gas pedal and a brake pedal in a car. So the neurotransmitters excite things, and the neuromodulators break things and cause them to calm down. And by observing behavior, we can actually make educated guesses about which neurochemicals are, are involved. This is why substituting different types of behaviors for each other need to have similar effects in the body or it will not be that effective in terms of making a change. Like you can get reward hormones by binge eating the same as you can build a ton of endorphins by exercising. But if you try to stop doing one without starting the other sometimes, and of course there are other examples, it doesn't have to be those two. If you do not substitute one behavior and the reward neurotransmitters for another behavior that was giving you reward neurotransmitters, the behavior that you're trying to adopt or make a new habit becomes extremely difficult for you. Understanding what type of transmitters cause different types of moods and subsequent behaviors is the entire field of psychiatry and welcome to mood stabilizing medications. Another form of behavior modification, um, which is a method of thinking, changing your thinking and changing your actions purposefully to support a more satisfying life comes into play with pain behavior. And pain behavior is the way we act when we're under the influence of pain perception. That can result from actual tissue damage or in chronic conditions, it can perpetuate the pain existence. You continue to feel the pain long after the trauma has actually occurred. And this is something that we see frequently in massage clients. We can even have clients coming in with something called phantom pain. Um, I have worked on amputees uh, that were complaining of leg pain uh, with a leg that they had not had for a decade. Now we cover pain extensively in another assignment later on. So I'm not going to wax poetic about it right now. And we're just going to jump into the parts of the central nervous system. Now, the largest and most complex unit of the nervous system is the brain. It is composed of approximately 100 billion with a B neurons, which are all crammed inside of your skull. Besides your intellect, your emotions, and your actions... The brain interprets, regulates, and coordinates all physiological activities of the body. On average, it weighs about three pounds, but it makes up more than 97% of the nervous system. There are multiple important parts to the brain, and we delve into those in quite a bit of detail later on this week. Um, but just to note the big ones, the cerebrum, also called the forebrain, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, which is below the lateral fissure, the occipital uh, lobe, which is anterior to the occipital bone of the skull. And there's actually a fifth lobe that for some reason isn't really talked about called the insula. And it's located under the lateral fissure, uh, fissure and is part of the limbic system that gives us a feeling or impression of what is real, true, and important. The insula basically helps you decide what is and isn't reality. So something really cool about massage therapy interacting with the cerebral cortex and the reticular activating system and the insula, the same mechanisms involved in consciousness, basically. Consequently, massage methods often generate the sensations experienced during altered states of consciousness. Most of the major spiritual disciplines have a movement or positional aspect in their practices that contributes to the meditative states experienced by their participants. Some even incorporate touch, which enhances the experience. 
I have had many clients state that they feel that they are someplace else. They feel that they have been transported or they go into a meditative state nearly like a trance when they are in a massage. The next portion of the central nervous system is the brain stem. Now the brain stem is considered the primitive portion of the brain and is divided into three main parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Research shows that the brainstem probably processes most of the sensory data generated by massage modalities. Another area that is affected by massage modalities is the second largest part of the brain, the cerebellum. Massage techniques that stimulate the cerebellum, such as rhythmic rocking, have widespread influence on the body. Methods that alter the body's positional sense and initiate specific movement patterns change sensory input from the muscles, the tendons, the joints, and the skin. The output from the cerebellum goes to the motor cortex and the brain stem. Stimulation of the cerebellum by alteration of muscle tone, position, and vestibular balance also stimulates the hypothalamus to adjust autonomic nervous system functions and restores there's the magic word again, homeostasis. Rocking produces movement at the neck and head that influences our sense of equilibrium by stimulating the balance mechanisms of the inner ear. These mechanisms include the vestibular context and they do all of the writing reflexes which work to keep our heads level. A close relationship exists between the vestibular nerves and the cerebellum. Rocking also stimulates muscle contraction patterns that pass throughout the body. Pressure on the side of the body may stimulate the writing reflexes as well. Hey guys, let's talk about the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain, being the most complex organ in the body, uses 20% of oxygen you inhale. The brain actually makes up 2% of your total body weight. And the brain is nearly 60% fat. This is why healthy fats such as omega-3 and 6 are vital for brain health. Healthy fats help reduce inflammation and help improve immune function. The spinal cord is not one unified cord, but actually a bundle of individual nerves packed together in a long tube, which sends and receives signals from all areas of the body. Believe it or not, the spinal cord does not take all of its commands from the brain. It is able to send signals directly to muscles when necessary. Think about reflexes. The spinal cord stops growing once you turn five years old. If you found some value in this video, leave a comment, share, and follow for more. Of course, we need to talk about disabilities and dysfunction of the central nervous system. How does, how does that apply to massage therapy? Well, the disability or dysfunction caused by brain and spinal cord injuries are very often determined by the region and function of the area affected. The prognosis for trauma to the motor neurons is commonly difficult to identify. Soft tissue methods of massage therapy and other forms of movement therapy seem to be the most beneficial as part of the whole healthcare picture. Specific recommendations about massage are difficult to make solely on the basis of the location of damage because the body compensates by rerouting the interrupted signals. A really cool side note about this is like if someone breaks their left arm, you can very often help by massaging the right arm. This is why clinical reasoning methods are so important. The ability to process a situation and determine the best interventions is an essential skill if you want to succeed as a massage therapy professional. For example, spastic paralysis results from upper motor neuron injuries. So a client comes in with these type of injuries will have spastic paralysis of the muscles in the affected region. Voluntary control over movement is lost and limbs may have to be restrained to prevent involuntary movement at inappropriate times. Meaning if they're laying face down on the table, all right, so they're prone and their arm is hanging down, it could swing out wildly and hit you in the legs while you're trying to massage their back. Usually less muscle atrophy is present and lymph and blood flow continues because of the working of the muscles. The preferred modalities when applied to each individual can moderate some of the random spasms and keep the soft tissues more supple and the joints more mobile, resulting in less rigidity in the muscles. This is true of something where, um, where like an arm is locked out a grand portion of the time, cross fiber friction, 
um, around the electron process, bringing some blood into that area. Anywhere there where there's an aponeurosis, where you have like a lot of fascia buildup, um, you want to do these friction techniques to promote extra blood flow to these areas. And you want to do some stretching and gentle compression on those muscles that are frequently tensed up um, from getting all of this excitement of the motor neurons and constantly being in action. With lower motor neuron difficulties, the muscles atrophy and actions and reflexes are slow, limited, or non-existent. Massage and joint movement may be able to replace the mechanical pumping action of normal muscle contraction and assist in moving the blood and lymph. In addition, keeping the soft tissue pliable may lessen any contractures. This is where you would see someone who is like um, a paraplegic or something like that, or they have significant loss of function in limbs and they are unable to walk or move on their own, you're going to be massaging those areas to promote healthy blood flow to those regions and to get some at least passive muscle movement. <clears throat> so what are some other things that affect the central nervous system and how it functions? Uh, drugs. Drugs absolutely affect um, people. Physical dependency, such as addiction, um, can have some pretty ugly withdrawal symptoms. Tolerance, um, which occurs with stimulants and depressants. You know, of course, it means that people take a lot more of this substance to be able to feel its effects. People that have a tolerance to pain medication is something to watch out for in massage therapy clients. Very often, I would have people come in that would take a huge amount of pain medication because they wanted their massage to feel relaxing even though they had a multitude of injuries that we were working on helping them recover from. And this can be pretty dangerous because you can overstimulate an area or use excessive pressure in an area that you should not be using and possibly re-injure it to some extent because the client doesn't feel the pain. These are definitely things to watch out for. Of course, there are things like strokes, spinal cord injury, um, cerebrovascular disease, if someone has brain tumors. We cover more of these in your pathology course. Uh, these aren't necessarily something that you're going to be working directly on as a massage therapist. However, you will be working on clients that have neurodegenerative disorders or neurodegenerative disease, which is just a, a broad range term for conditions that affect the neurons in the brain. Um, most of these are what we consider to be various dementia diseases, like Alzheimer's disease. Um, <clears throat> There can also be people with seizures that come in, various types of epilepsy. There's more than simply grand mal epilepsy. Um, there are people with tremors, like an essential tremor is a chronic tremor that does not result from any pathological condition. It's progressive, but it's not really debilitating. Um, they just shake continuously, and these are things that you need to be aware of and be able to accommodate in the massage therapy office. Parkinson's disease, um, this is where the neurons that release the neurotransmitter dopamine start to gener degenerate, um, and it occurs mostly in the elderly. It can start occurring earlier on in life. This will also cause a tremor. Another CNS issue that is probably going to be one of your most frequent massage uh, client complaints is going to be a headache. There are a ton of type of headaches. There are vascular headaches, tension headaches, migraines, which are absolutely debilitating. These things are covered more in depth in one of your assignments. Uh, things that have to do with declines in the, in the neurotransmitters uh, like norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Things like depression. There's you know, persistent depressive disorder, postpartum depression after having the baby, psychotic depression. Um, that's when depression becomes so severe, it has some type of psychosis um, attached to it, um, like as like delusions or hallucinations can occur. Um, these aren't necessarily dangerous to you. 
Um, obviously not contagious, but in terms of the client acting out, you need to know that client well, perhaps be in touch with their main healthcare provider to make sure that any client with psychosis is not prone to violent outbreaks as they may not quite be in touch with reality. Anxiety, um, which is a reaction to stress, but that can get quite a bit worse. Um, it can lead to panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, phobias, um, obsessive compulsive disorders. You will frequently see massage clients with anxiety disorders. Uh, this is covered in a later assignment. This is something that you definitely want to pay attention to every time you see it. Massage is fantastic for anxiety. Uh, because we are working on that parasympathetic nervous system and we are going to be affecting that vagus nerve. Uh, there's those key words again. So please pay attention to anything that you see that has to do with massage and anxiety disorders. There's a few other things that affect clients that are less related to your clinic um, such as schizophrenia. Not many people would ever see a massage client uh, to work because of their schizophrenia, perhaps with anxiety related to having schizophrenia, brain abscesses, um, which includes pus and other material in the brain from a bacterial or fungal infection. Um, there's going to be swelling and inflammation in the brain. You will not be seeing these clients um, unless this is a hospice situation and that is a secondary thing to what else is going on with them and you are there just to offer palliative care or just some comforting healing touch at the end of life. Infectious diseases um, like encephalitis and meningitis, these are pretty dangerous. Um, these are usually from bacterial infection, some are from viral infection. Antibiotics, of course, are given for a bacterial infection. If you speak to your clients during the initial intake, when you speak to them, make sure that you find out if they're on any antibiotics and what they're for. Do not put yourself in danger of a bacterial infection of any type. Now, myelitis is an infection of the spinal cord or brain stem that affects motor and sensory functions. Um, that is from a virus. Your body will just have to fight it in the immune system. Again, anytime someone says they have any type of infectious disease, please protect yourself. This is a contraindication and reschedule the massage.